Good day everyone, now I'm going to be discussing regarding the economic development in the 19th century as a result of context. So, for just a brief introduction, um, the Philippines was a colony of Spain for more than 300 years. So, or, uh, to be exact, 333 years. The Spaniards were very corrupt and they did monopolize the economy of the Philippines. From a mercantilism economy where Spaniards rules their process of import and export, this in the 19th century it is actually where the free trade happened, where the growth of the Philippines started. So firstly let's discuss or let's give description to mercantilism. It's actually the economic system used to unify and increase the power and monetary wealth of a country by street government regulation of trade and foreign trading monopolies. So an example of mercantilism economy is say for example the Philippines wanted to import abaca from France. But the thing is this could not they cannot do this and it's possible for them to import abaca from France even if the price from France is much cheaper. Because all goods from the colony of Sp Philippines had to go to Spain. They cannot ex export goods from the Philippines to other countries and then what will happen is Spain will sell the goods to other countries as a substantial markup wherein they can have much more profits than the Philippines so that they can benefit to it. In other words, the colonists did not did all the job and hard work but it would be the Sp Spaniards that would take advantage of the profit from the Philippines. It was actually disadvantageous to the Philippines while it's advantageous to Spain, especially to the royal family. But mercantilism did actually end there because free trade did happen on the 19th century. Just an overview, trade policy does not restrict imports or exports. It can also be understood as the free market idea applied in international trade. So the opening of the ports and the world trade provided economic growth to the Philippines. When the port was open for the world trade, traders started to visit the Philippines for an exchange of their goods. This were the change of mercantilism economy to laissez fair economy. Then it happens, the opening of the world pours to the world. The trade provided economic growth to the Philippines as I have mentioned. When the port was opened for world trade, traders started to visit the Philippines for an exchange of their goods. This were the change of mercantilism economy, economy to the laissez fair economy. In this state, the rise of economy um, helped the Filipinos to have the ability to send products outside the Philippines to other countries. The increase of demand and supplies arises as the economy uh, for the economy of the Philippines. Due to the rise of demand, there was also an increase of the supply, having the farmers and tenants forced to produce more agricultural products due to the increase in demand. As a result, this eventually leads to the rise of Filipino middle and upper class. When they started to get more money, they used it for the education of their children. The rise of the middle and upper class then led to the education of their children. So this education affects their students. Um, the, chil the children learn the essence of nationalism in school, and they were able to become a nationalistic. They views, their views changed from the very naive view of Philippine history to a very nationalistic view. They were able to see the wrongdoings of the Spaniards and the corruption. To end the discussion, I am providing you the, the summary of what did happen in the economic development of the 19th century as per results view of context. Again, this is Mildred Reyes Kai reporting for economic development. Good day everyone, I am Hani Lumberkilia and at this point of time let us continue with the discussion about the Philippines in the 19th century as a results context in economic, social and political aspects. The economic aspect was being discussed by Mildred Kaay and my part here is to report about the social aspects of the Philippines during the 19th century. In this topic, I am going to discuss about the social structure of the Philippines during that time, during the Spanish colonization, the social cultural context, the Philippine educational system in the Philippines, and what were the things the Filipino people experienced 
during that time and how were they affected by it. So to start with, I'll give you some highlights of the social aspects during the 19th century as Rizal's context. Philippines in the 19th century was the era of challenges and responses. It was the period of major changes that affect man and society. It was also called the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. The Filipinos in this time were unfortunate victims of the evils of an unjust, biased, and deteriorating power. With regard to the social structure, Philippines was predominantly feudalistic. Feudalistic means it is a system in which people were given land and protection by people of higher rank and worked and fought for them in return. Philippines has this system as a consequence or as a result of the encomienda system, which will be tackled later on in political aspect, but to give you some heads up on what encomienda system is, it is a Spanish land-holding system imposed upon the country with the arrival of the conquistadores. An elite class exploited the masses, fostered by the master-slave relationship between the Spaniards and the Filipinos. It is where the Spaniards exacted all forms of taxes and tributes, and even required the natives to render polo e servicio, or forced labor, to the government and the church. Consequently, the poor becomes poorer and the rich becomes richer. During the 19th century, Philippines' social structure was divided into three categories. First is the highest class. Spaniards, Peninsulares, and Friars are among those who belong to this group. They have the authority and power to dominate the Filipinos. Second is the middle class. This group includes indigenous people, mestizos and criollos. Lastly is the lowest social class. This consists solely of Filipinos. To have a better understanding of the socio-cultural context of the Philippines during that time, I have here a picture for you to visualize from top to bottom. First is the Peninsulares. Second is the Insulares. Third, the Spanish Mestizos. Fourth, the Principalia. Fifth, Chinese Mestizos. Sixth, the Chinese. And lastly, the Indios. You may have wondered what are those words, the Peninsulares, the Insulares, and such. So I have here some definitions for you to have an idea of what these words mean. Peninsulares, Spanish-born Spaniards or mainland Spaniards that resides in the Philippines. Second, the Insulares, or known as Criolos and Criolis the Spaniards born in the Philippines, who were also called Filipinos. Third, in the Philippines, Filipino mestizo, in Spanish mestizo, in feminine mestiza, the masculine is mestizo, is a name used to refer to people of mixed native Filipino and any foreign ancestry, that is why it's called Spanish mestizo. Fourth, the principalia, or noble class was the ruling and usually educated upper class in the towns of colonial Philippines. It is composed of the gobernador Silio, who had functions similar to a town mayor, and the cabezas de barangay, chiefs of the barangays, who governed the districts. Fifth, the Chinese mestizo. Person of mixed Chinese and native Filipino ancestry, respectively during the Spanish colonial era in the Philippines. Sixth, the Chinese, which we are most familiar with. Seventh, or the last one, is the Indios. These are the indigenous people of the Philippines. To proceed, let us now have the Philippine educational system during Spanish time. In 1855, the year Spain realized the need of establishing a system of public education for the Indios. Indios, which refers to the indigenous people of the Philippines. This was also the year that Governor Jan Crespo 
organized a commission and recommended remedial measures to improve elementary education. In 1861, the year commission completed its report and forwarded it to Spain. And in 1863, it was also the year that the Educational Decree of 1863 was issued. And now, let us have the provisions of Educational Decree of 1863. First, establishments of teacher training school. Second, government supervises the public school system. Third, the use of Spanish as medium of instruction in all schools. And lastly, establishment of one primary schools for boys and for girls in each of major towns. However, there were defects of educational system during Spanish time. First is the emphasis on religion. Under that, is the fear of God was emphasized, obedience to friars was instilled in the mind of the people, Indians were constantly reminded that they have inferior intelligence and were fit for manual labor only. The will of God was also emphasized. Second, absence of academic freedom. Most schools were not open to the natives, and students were not allowed to express their opinion. Third, racial discrimination. Prior to educational decree of 1863, the schools were not open to the natives. Spaniards hesitated to consider the Indians as educated as themselves. Lastly, limited curriculum. Education was limited to the three R's, that is, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Among all of the things that I have mentioned and discussed earlier, Filipinos also experienced and were affected in social aspects with these following. First, human rights that were denied to them. Second, no equality before the law. Third, racial discrimination. Fourth, Hacienda's owned by the friars. And fifth, the gorgeous veil. To discuss further, first, the human rights that were denied to the Filipinos. Since the adoption of the Spanish Constitution of 1812 and other constitutions in succeeding years, the people of Spain enjoyed freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of association, and other human rights, except the freedom of religion. The Spanish authorities who cherished these human rights in Spain denied them to the Filipinos in Asia. Second, no equality before the law. Spaniards arrogantly regarded the brown-skinned Filipinos as inferior beings. In Spanish Penal Code, which was enforced in the Philippines, particularly imposed heavier penalties on native Filipinos or mestizos and lighter penalties on white-complexioned Spaniards. As we can observe, there is inequality in enforcing the law between the Filipino and the Spanish people. Third is the racial discrimination. Filipinos as inferior beings who were infinitely undeserving of the rights and privileges that the white Spaniards enjoyed. Spaniard called the brown-skinned and flat-nosed Filipinos Indios or Indians. In retaliation, the Filipinos dubbed their pale complexion detractors with a disparaging term bangus or milkfish. Fourth, Hacienda's owned by the Friars. Friars is a member of any certain religious orders of men. So during Rizal's time, the Spanish friars belonging to different religious orders were the richest landlords, for they owned the best haciendas, or what we call agricultural lands, in the Philippines. Gorja Civil They had rendered meritorious services in suppressing the bandits in the provinces. They later became infamous for their rampant abuses such as maltreating innocent people, looting their carabaos, chickens and valuable belongings, and which also includes raping women. Rizal himself witnessed the discrimination of how the Gorja Civil, either Filipino or Insularis, treated the Filipinos. It is evident that the Philippines in the 19th century, as Rizal's context, experienced these unfortunate events and happenings in their lives. 
with regard to the social aspect. As we can observe, social ranking was created in the society. Social tensions was also created between or among the categories or classes in the socio-cultural context. A system of racial discrimination was present as well. Higher positions or high positions in the government were opened only to the pure-blooded Spanish. Moreover, members of the middle class and the Indians were considered as inferior by the upper class and unworthy of education. On top of that, Filipinos also experienced the feeling of inequality and injustice or unjust in everything that they have and in everything that they do. They don't have the right as a Filipino. So, to discuss further about the political aspect as results context in 19th century, let us have Hesed E. Morla. Thank you all for listening. Political development or aspect? Now, for the political development, I would like to ask a question first. As to what was the political situation in Spain during the 19th century? Well, Spain in the 19th century was typified by the struggle between liberals and conservatives. On the one hand, the liberals were the people who wanted to fight for democracy. They wanted the people to vote for their leader. They wanted freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and etc. While the conservatives wanted to remain with status quo, what, what I mean by this is that the conservatives wanted to continue with the royal bloodline, to continue with the government ruled by the royal family. While the liberals did not want the royal family to continue to rule, because they wanted to vote their own, own leader they wanted. Their leader to come from the people, not the royal family. So in the 19th century, Spain was characterized by intermittent. Intermittent civil wars and Spain lost most if not all of its colonies in South America. In the 19th century, because of these civil wars, there was a war between the liberals and the conservatives. For most of the 19th century, so the colonies of Spain and South America include, you know, already like Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, um, Chile, Bolivia, Peru. Most of them started to gain even Mexico gained its independence during the 19th century during the early part of the 19th century so how did this affect the philippines of course we can say that in the 19th century spain was characterized by political instability indeed there was political instability in spain because of the struggle between liberals and conservatives but how did this affect the Philippines? Did it have a positive or negative effect? Of course, we can ascertain that it had a negative effect. It definitely had a negative effect. One of the negative effects of the political instability in Spain was the constant practice of replacing governor generals. Imagine from 1853 to 1898, there were 31 governor generals in a span of 45 years. No? What do you think is the effect of this to our country? I'll give you an analogy example. Let's say Cebu, we got at the local level. In Cebu, we have year 2020. Our governor is, for example, Borla, and then after a few months, she's replaced by Min Chavez and then after a few months again he replaced by Jay and then and then after a year Tampos is replaced by Bagon and then so on and so forth no so how would it affect you 
or how would it affect the people of Cebu, of course? It has a very negative effect, even an ingrudious one. Why? Well, if you look at it, if there are a lot of changes in the government officials, who will be the government official during what year or during a span of months or even weeks, weeks there will be no consistent, no? So, ang um, mga govern, governor kay dili consistent, like usab-usab, no? Palaces projects will not be finished, and the palaces will continuously change, and that will definitely affect the people. And we can say then that the Philippines became a dumpling ground for inept bureaucrats. Bureaucrats, no? So, inept meaning walay pulos, no? They do not have... Uh, they were very incompetent. The bureaucrats were very incompetent. Their main criteria as to why they were sent to the Philippines. Why? Simply because of their loyalty to the king. Uh, they were loyal men to the king, but they didn't have any merit as to why they were being sent to the Philippines. No, They simply enriched themselves having no interest in the Filipino people. They come to the Philippines as poor men, but return to Spain as rich men. And of course, as well, as we all mentioned as a while ago, you no, know, there were there was a failure to make or achieve consistent policies. Policies constantly change from time to time because of the changes in government officials in the governor. And then we can also say that there was indeed political instability in the 19th century there was indeed political instability so the philippines was very very affected by the political situation in spain and you have to remember these four characteristics no? to the political development if you look at this two failure to provide for the basic needs no uh, they have failure to provide um, in the public works, goals, and peace and order. So, there are many um, political situation in in Spain. No? So, um, the taxes the taxes were never fully utilized, and limited participation of the Filipinos in government. Uh, do you think the Filipino people would have just agreed to this, or do you think they would have? went against the Spaniards after experiencing the tree, of course. They went, this tree, of course, they went for uh, the latter. They said enough was enough. Um, why is there rampant corruption? Rampant corruption. Why were their taxes not fully utilized? Why did the government fail to provide basic needs for them, like public works, schools, and peace and order? Why was their limited participation? No? Why was the highest position that the Filipino can attain only a governor? Why why was it only a governor Silio? No, for example, why not governor general? So they clamored for change. No? They wanted change and they had enough already of what this what the Spaniards were doing to them for more than three hundred years. In the 19th century, they developed that sense of nationalism simply because they had enough. They were done with it and they wanted to change the norm. So, that's how Filipino nationalism developed as a result of the political development and, of course, the economic development. So, these two are the reasons for the economic development and for the political you know, this too also on how accelerated accelerated Filipino nationalism so in conclusion um, the rise of the middle upper class led to the education of Rizal and then rival, rivalry between friars and tenants became one of the motivators of Rizal to call for reforms of the church and then there is the rampant corruption of the government became one 
of the reasons why Rizal called for the reforms in government. And then the last is the lack of concern of the government officials simply motivated Rizal to call for the education of his fellow Filipinos. Thank you for listening. That's the end of my discussion. Thank you.